Right. I, I think we can begin to make a beginning. I'll um, I'll start by saying a, I'll say a few words while people are still coming in. Um, uh, I should point out this webinar is being recorded. So if you make a comment in the Q and A that you'd like that you'd like to see snipped out, just email me straight after, and we'll get it done. Um, I'm not hosting this event from Brunel University, but from home. Uh, home is where the hearth is here behind me. Uh, reminding us of another energy transition. It's still ongoing away from coal. Uh, in this fireplace, coal is no longer burned. Instead, over there, there's a radiator heated by fossil gas. Uh, but how fast will the transition from gas take place? How much of a role can hydrogen play in that? And will it have any role at all in domestic heating? So these are some of the questions we'll be discussing this evening. Um, when sitting beside this, this fireless hearth the other day, I was reading Primo Levi's novel, The Periodic Table, and in the section on hydrogen, he describes producing it when he was a child back in the 1930s, producing it by electrolysis. I don't know what color uh, category of hydrogen that would have been, certainly not green. Anyway, when he took a match to the gas, there was an angry explosion. He felt as if he'd unleashed a force of nature. And for me, this brings to mind some of the rhetoric I'm seeing around the hydrogen economy. We're unleashing a force of nature. Uh, but how world changing will this new gas be and how explosive a transition is this going to be? Um, in setting up this event, I had a couple of aims in mind. One is to one is to feed into the ongoing discussions about hydrogen here at Brunel University and these discussions, they center on research uh, among the engineers, but they bring in the social scientists as well to look at questions of government policy, political economy, political ecology. And in the chat box <clears throat> in a minute, I'll put a link to Brunel's hydrogen research. The other aim uh, is connected to questions in my own mind about whether hydrogen is going to be vital to the decarbonization agenda, or is this another case of technology fetishism? In other words, is it promoting the myth that climate change mitigation can be achieved almost magically through new, new, gadget, new gadgets, new gizmos, when in reality politics and, and social change are gonna be key. And I think the wise path is to assume it's basically technology fetishism. You see, ever since climate change became a concern in the 1980s, one new technology after another has been proposed as silver, silver bullets uh, for the problem. But the carbon dioxide emissions, the methane emissions, they carry on rising relentlessly, and now faster than ever. Uh, the Financial Times last week said, we're going in the, pointed out, we're going in the wrong direction at maximum speed. Already, the promises of COP26 are up in flames, some of them literally. And this isn't a great surprise as it has happened 25 times before. But if the world does one day decide to take the climate crisis seriously, rather than just pretending to, it is clear that hydrogen will have a role to play. The question is, which roles for hydrogen can help address the climate crisis and which are pointless or even harmful? And to discuss all these issues, we're joined by four experts on the hydrogen, hydrogen and the hydrogen economy. Um, I'm delighted and grateful that they can be here today. Um, each is gonna speak for 20 minutes. Could you put the next slide up please, um, Seb? Um, so the event is structured in two parts. There'll be a Q&A after each one. In the second part, the focus is on Britain and blue hydrogen. In the first part, we're, we're looking at global issues and green hydrogen. And the speakers here are Francisca Müller from Hamburg University. She's, Francisca has been doing some fabulously interesting research looking at the hydrogen economy through a social justice lens. But before Francisca, we have Mark Jacobson from Stanford. Mark has been a key figure in debunking the green pretensions of blue hydrogen. I'm thinking, for instance, of his research on the colossal methane leakage from the gas industry involved in blue hydrogen. Um, but here he's going to be speaking on green hydrogen. So over to you, Mark, and, and good morning. Oh, good morning, uh, Bill. Thank you very much for a uh, good inter kind introduction. And so let me just share my screen. <clears throat> Hold on. Um, so I'm going to talk about, well, green hydrogen, but also, you know, also, why not blue hydrogen or gray hydrogen um, or any other colors of hydrogen? Um, so first, can you see my screen? 
Yeah. So, um, okay, great. So let me start out by just identifying, well, what are efficient uses of green hydrogen? Let me define green hydrogen is hydrogen produced by electrolysis, uh, namely where the ele electricity comes from clean renewable energy, such as wind, solar, geothermal, hydroelectric, tidal, or wave power. And so efficient uses of hydrogen and green hydrogen in particular are for long distance transport, like long distance aircraft, ships, trains, um, some long distance trucks and military vehicles. So airplanes, for example, long distance means greater than 1500 kilometer distance. Shorter than that, uh, we can use battery electric airplanes, um, but longer. So short, long haul flights, by the way, just to put it in perspective, about 54% of all airplane mileage uh, flown each year, there are 30 million flights flown each year. Of the mileage, about 54% is long haul flights, greater than 1500 kilometers, <clears throat> but about 84% of flights by number are short haul flights. So only about 16% of flights by number are long haul. So we think those we need hydrogen fuel cell or hydrogen fuel cell battery electric hybrids. Um, so that's one application, same with long distance ships. Although you could have charging stations in the middle of the ocean where you do battery swapping or, or ship charging for uh, pure electric and uh, long distance trains, trucks and military vehicles, but also steel production instead of uh, using carbon to reduce uh, iron ore to pure iron, uh, you can use hydrogen. And if it's green hydrogen, you can actually reduce 98% of carbon emissions from steel. Um, and then some electricity and heat production in remote microgrids uh, with fuel cells uh, using hydrogen, green hydrogen. But we do not think it, uh, hydrogen should be used for building heating uh, or passenger vehicles because battery electrics will even though using green hydrogen in a passenger vehicle is relatively clean, uh, you still need about two to three times the number of wind turbines compared with running a battery electric passenger vehicle. But that, uh, as you get to longer distance, heavier transport, then uh, you, the efficiencies, comparative efficiencies of battery electric versus hydrogen fuel cells uh, even out. And at some point, hydrogen fuel cells become more efficient because at some point you're just carrying around way too many batteries and you're using a lot of energy to do that. Uh, and also stationary electricity storage is maybe except for some app, some um, exceptions is not a good application of green hydrogen because just using batteries is much more efficient. Uh, you'll just, again, need fewer wind turbines and solar panels to um, charge batteries for battery electricity for station grid electricity. Um, so let's look at a uh, blue versus gray hydrogen, the versus green hydrogen. And so why would we not use blue, even blue hydrogen, which is, well, gray hydrogen is natural gas producing hydrogen either from steam methane reforming uh, or from autothermal reforming. And then blue hydrogen is the same as that, but adding carbon capture. So uh, Bob Howarth and I did a study uh, in 2021 looking at this issue of blue versus gray hydrogen in particular. And so some of the assumptions are, well, we assume steam methane reforming for the analysis, although I'll talk about autothermal reforming here as well. Uh, then there's the emission rate, really. It's not necessarily the leakage rate, but the emission rate of methane uh, from the upstream uh, mining and transport of methane or of natural gas to, because you need natural gas for two purposes with steam methane reforming. Uh, one is to provide energy and for high temperatures and high pressures. And the second uh, is to, for the actual feedstock uh, to produce the hydrogen. And so you need a lot of methane uh, for these two processes. Um, but, and then when you mine the methane, most of it in parts of the world is high, from hydraulic fracking. But uh, regardless, there, the methane leakage, leakage rates alone from some places are really high, like in Turkmenistan, where the, you have the uh, largest gas fields in the world, uh, the average leakage rate base just from the mines themselves uh, from satellite data are about 4.1%. Uh, there was a flyover in New Mexico study from satellite in New Mexico recently that, that showed 9.4% leakage rate of natural gas coming from uh, New Mexico uh, gas fracking wells. And, but we assumed 3.5% uh, worldwide with a range of 1.5 to 4.3%. Uh, so we tried high and low values as well, but the mean was 3.5%. We think that's fairly reasonable. 
Now there's even though the fossil fuel industry claims that you can go lower than you know one percent uh, leakage rate. And by the way, this is, again, it's not just a leakage rate; it's an emission rate because you do need some energy to push hydrogen through this. Sorry, sorry, methane, natural gas through the system. And there are other sources of emissions associated that there's intentional burnoffs as well of, in the process. Um, so anyway, 3.5% we think is reasonable. Then the other process when you're looking at blue hydrogen is carbon dioxide capture. And there are two types of capture. You need two sets of capture equipment. One is for uh, capturing the flue gas for the energy and the other, the CO2 from the energy production. And then the other is capturing the CO2 uh, from the feedstock. Now the pure feed, the feedstock, the resulting uh, flow of, of CO2 from that is more pure. And so there's actually only one uh, data set that actually has data from uh, carbon capture from a, a steam methane reforming of the feedstock. And that is in Alberta. And the capture rate there is 78.8%. So we assume that's the low value. We assumed a mean value of 85% capture rate. Uh, from steam methane reforming from the pure stream, and then 65% uh, capture rate from the uh, energy production. And the actual data for uh, plants is between 20 and seven, sorry, 20 and 70%. And I'll discuss that a little bit later. So 65% is at the upper end. Now, theoretically, you can capture 90%, but that's when you have uh, full load and for 100% of the year. But because uh, carbon capture is not operating during 100% of the year because it's down for either repairs or maintenance, or sometimes there's no demand for the CO2. And for other reasons and inefficiencies, the actual capture rates are between 20 and 70%. So 65% is an upper end. And it's actually even higher, like there's the Boundary Dam carbon capture project in Canada. They've been operating five years and the average capture rate there is 55%. So again, this is pretty reasonable, we think. Then we looked at a 20 year global warming potential, but also, 100 year global warming potential, 20 years is more relevant because climate impacts are happening rapidly and anything that's going to damage the climate more over 20 years will cause positive feedbacks that will be very difficult to overcome. So this is more relevant than 100 years. So when we accounted for um, the leakage rates of methane and we accounted and the emission rates of methane and we accounted for the carbon capture inefficiencies. And by the way, we didn't even look at what happens to the carbon dioxide after capture, but if it's used for enhanced oil recovery, then 40% of it then goes right back to the air, but we did not even account for that. So gray hydrogen, which is the steam methane reforming um, here on the left bar, you can see the CO2 emissions and then um, the and from not being captured and uncaptured CO2, and plus the methane emissions, uh, given in carbon dioxide equivalent emissions of methane, uh, that's in the red. And so with gray hydrogen, you get the highest emissions, but blue hydrogen is hardly reducing the total CO2 equivalent. And we have two cases of blue hydrogen, one where the flue gas is captured, one where it's not. And in both cases, it's still pretty high emissions. And the, all these cases are higher emissions than just burning natural gas for heat without any capture and also higher than burning diesel oil or coal for heat. So right away, you can see there's no benefit of blue hydrogen. And just to summarize this in some numbers, gray hydrogen, uh, 153 grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule, blue hydrogen between 135 and 139. So just a minor reduction of CO2, burning natural gas for heat, 111. If you instead powered blue hydrogen by renewables, uh, which is not going to be done. And if you do that, you're then preventing those renewables from displacing coal or natural gas power plants, which is a big opportunity cost because when renewables replace a coal or natural gas power plant, you're not only eliminating the CO2 emissions from the, that plant, but you're also eliminating the air pollution, you're eliminating the upstream mining. So I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But just in terms of CO2, 52 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour versus green hydrogen, zero grams of CO2 sorry, per megajoule, not kilowatt hour, uh, with green hydrogen, zero grams of CO2 per megajoule. Well, what about using autothermal reforming? That's a, been proposed. Um, so per, put in perspective, steam methane reforming, you get uh, four molecules of hydrogen per molecule of methane because you have two water molecules added but with ATR, autothermal reforming, you only get two hydrogen molecules per methane molecule. 
you can increase that to 2.9 by re reacting a waste carbon monoxide with steam, but this requires even more equipment and energy, but it's still less than four. So you have, uh, you get at least 38% more uh, hydrogen with steam methane reforming than you do with autothermal reforming. So that means you're going to need more natural gas to run the autothermal equipment, no matter how efficient the, the autothermal equipment is, you're gonna need more natural gas and you'll have more upstream leakage as a result. In addition, ATR requires pure oxygen to be separated from air and that requires more equipment and energy. And uh, to reduce the carbon dioxide capture needs, you use energy uh, for heat and uh, oxygen, the energy for the heat and oxygen separation, it can be obtained with a hydrogen fuel cell, but that requires more equipment as well. So you can see all this massive amounts of equipment um, versus green hydrogen. Well, all you need is a solar cell and a solar PV cell and an electrolyzer. Um, here you need pipes, you need mines, you need pipes for the methane, the natural gas. You also need pipes once you capture the CO2. Uh, and you need all sorts of equipment. And so the ATR always results in 38 to 100% more methane leaks and upstream pollution. Um, the CO2 can't, from ATR can be captured more efficiently, uh, but there's more CO2 produced. So you're capturing it more efficiently, but there's more of it. So anyway, there's no real benefit of using ATR over SMR. In fact, uh, most, uh, I mean, 96% of all hydrogen today is produced from SMR. And, and nothing from ATR. And this is, so this is really a proposal for the future, uh, but there's a reason uh, ATR is not used and it's because it requires all this additional equipment and it's not as efficient at producing hydrogen. So let's um, look though at the carbon capture portion of this. Uh, why not carbon capture at all? And so this is something that people really never look at. So I'm gonna talk specifically about, there was a coal plant in the US the Petronova facility that was uh, retrofitted to add carbon capture to it. And it started operating, well, it operated from 2017 to 19, and then it was mothballed in 2019. So what they did, this is down in Texas, they had this coal plant that, so part of the coal plant, they retrofitted with uh, carbon capture equipment, but to run the carbon capture equipment, they actually built a natural gas plant just to run the carbon capture equipment for the coal plant. This is already to, you can see how inefficient and ridiculous this is. And it costs $1 billion for the carbon capture equipment and for the natural gas plant. So there's now they have to mine natural gas then pipe it to this natural gas plant, burn it to produce electricity and then connect the electricity to run the carbon capture equipment, which they also had to purchase. So this is an analysis of the CO2 emissions from that plant and the carbon capture. This is, these are from data from the first year. And I'll, I'll give you a summary of the, all three years, but this is, I had the data for this for the first year. So from the coal plant itself, the CO2 emissions are about, I'm gonna look at the 20 year time frame since that's most relevant, 450 grams of CO2 per megawatt, kilograms per megawatt hour of CO2 from the upstream emissions of, the, of methane and also from all the other energy used to uh, produce the coal. And then there's 930 kilograms per megawatt hour of CO2 from the stack. So that's a total of about 1,380 kilograms per megawatt hour. The capture equipment over the first year captured 55% of the stack emissions or 516, um, but the natural gas plant due to the mining and, and transport and combustion emissions, 367 uh, kilograms of CO2 per megawatt hour went back to the air. So 516 minus 367 is 149 is the net capture rate. Divide that by the 1381 kilograms of CO2 from the coal plant originally. Uh, that's 10.8% capture rate of in the first year. Now, uh, over average over all, all three years, the percent of stack CO2 captured instead of 55% was 70% total, but that, that wouldn't change this number a whole lot. Over a hundred year time frame, there's a 20% capture rate. So already you can see this is completely useless for helping climate when you have 90% of the CO2, or even if it's 85 or 80% of the CO2 going right back to the air. On top of that, the CO2 what, that was captured, it was sent to a nearby oil field for enhanced oil recovery. So 40% of that CO2 went right back to the air. So that 10.8% is really around six to 7% capture rate, completely useless. If we look at the CO2 equivalent emissions of not only these two cases, but a couple other cases, uh, let's start on the left here. 
where there's, um, if you do nothing, that's the CO2 emissions from the coal plant around 1,380 kilograms per CO2 of CO2 per megawatt hour. The second is when you um, capture the CO2 with natural gas, there you reduce the CO2 emissions, which is the, are the red, but you don't reduce the upstream mining emissions from the coal, which are the orange and the blue, uh, but you add in the yellow, green, and purple, which are the natural gas emissions, either from the combustion, which is the yellow, or the upstream mining of the natural gas, uh, the, le the leakage of the methane, which is the green, or the other uh, emissions from the upstream mining, which is the purple. So you, that's where you get the 10.8% reduction. Now, instead, if you used wind to capture, to power the capture equipment, you eliminate those natural gas emissions. So there is some reduction, but, but if you instead use that wind to replace that portion of the coal plant, the exact same amount of wind to replace a, whatever a coal plant you can, you get a greater reduction. So there's always a better reduction by using renewable energy to replace a fossil fuel than it is to power carbon capture equipment. And if we look at the social cost, you can see this even more starkly. On the right, if you do nothing, you get the total social cost from the coal, which is the blue is the equipment cost, the brown is the air pollution cost, the black is the CO2 cost. Use carbon capture with gas, your social cost goes up because your equipment cost goes up your air pollution goes up 25 to 50% because you're using 25 to 50% more energy. In this case, the air pollution is from the natural gas and your CO2 emissions only go down marginally. So your total social cost goes up. If you use wind to power the capture equipment, your air pollution stays the same from the coal plant. Your equipment cost goes up with the blue and your CO2 goes down, but the total social cost because of the higher equipment cost is higher than doing nothing. And if you used wind to replace the coal plant, then you reduce equipment cost and you reduce air pollution and you reduce CO2. And so you have the, by far the best social cost is due to uh, replacing fossil fuel with a clean renewable energy. There's no benefit whatsoever of using carbon capture. So just to summarize, uh, using natural gas to run a coal CCU plant reduces CO2 only 11.8 to 20% over 20 to 100 years while increasing air pollution and mining 25% and incurring the CCU equipment cost using wind to run the coal CCU instead, reduces CO2 equivalent only 34 to 44% while keeping air pollution and mining the same while incurring an equipment cost. Using the same wind to replace coal reduces CO2 emissions, air pollution emissions in mining almost 50% and has no CCU equipment cost. Okay, so one last slide, which is an interesting, this is, um, so we've been looking at developing plans to uh, transition the world to 100% clean renewable energy. And in these plans, there's no fossil fuels whatsoever. But one question is what fraction of vehicles will be hydrogen fuel cell vehicles versus electric vehicles? So here I looked at the sensitivity test to see, you know, if you're, if you're using high heavy transport, like long distance heavy transport um, with hydrogen fuel cells, it turns out, you know, close to about 20 to 24% of the um, energy for transportation would be used for hydrogen. And the rest would be used just to basically to charge battery electric vehicles. Um, now I did a sensitivity said, well, what if we have fewer hydrogen fuel cell vehicles or more? And how would that affect the levelized cost of energy for all purposes? Um, and it's actually pretty interesting because hydrogen actually has two competing uh, impacts on cost. One is when you have a passenger vehicle, if you use hydrogen fuel cell instead of a battery electric, you drive up the costs because using a hydrogen fuel cell passenger vehicle is not very efficient you'll need more wind turbines so that costs more energy for example however there is one benefit of hy using hydrogen uh, for transportation is that it helps stabilize the, the grid uh, because when you have too much let's say you have 100 percent renewable grid sometimes you'll have too much wind too much solar well one thing you can do with that too much wind and solar is to produce heat another thing is to produce hydrogen which you can store so it can actually a certain amount of hydrogen in some places can actually lower the cost of energy as just because you're using extra electricity, when it, which would otherwise be shed or wasted, uh, you're using it to produce hydrogen. So I looked in a few different countries. These are all high cost countries, low cost countries. Um, I mean, we actually did the whole world, but I just actually chose the highest cost countries just to see what would happen. Um, so in some places, this is diff different penetrations of hydrogen. So in Taiwan, what we're seeing, which is the black line, you can see as you increase the penetration of hydrogen costs go up uh, because there's no grid benefit. All you're doing is raising the, um, you're displacing high, uh, battery electric vehicles, which are uh, cheaper basically than uh, with hydrogen fuel cell. 
Um, but in other places like Southeast Asia, it actually improves the, lowers the cost to more hydrogen uh, by, because of the grid stability impacts. Then in some other, all the other, well, in Israel, for example, and also in South Korea, um, as you increase the hydrogen, you get a reduction of cost, but then as you increase it more, then the cost goes up. So actually somewhere in the middle, is, there's an inflection point. So it actually seems to be very regionally dependent which of these two factors, the, uh, the benefits of hydrogen to grid stability versus the higher cost of using hydrogen versus battery electrics, there's a trade-off. Um, so anyway, this is ongoing research, but I thought it was an interesting result. So uh, anyway, some more information on blue and gray hydrogen and carbon capture and uh, other stuff I talked about is here and that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark, um, and for sticking to time so well as uh, in addition. To those who have um, uh, arrived late and missed part of Mark's talk, um, I should point out that this event is being recorded and you can, you'll be able to um, uh, watch that in, in your own time if, if, if you wish. So um, uh, thank, thank you, Mark, uh, for, for, for the talk. And uh, uh, there'll be a Q&A uh, straight after Francisca's um, contribution, which is coming up right now. Over to you, Francisca. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you also from the, thank you for the invitation. Um, and thanks very much to Mark for zooming us in on the uh, electrical and engineering debate. I will join from a political science perspective on green hydrogen and I'll also share my screen. So let me see. Yeah, there, there we are. Um, so I'm taking over with a political science perspective on green hydrogen, uh, hydrogen just risks and hydrogen justice. And I'll illustrate this with a few examples from our recent research. And that talk is based on a recent article we have written in our research group, H2 Politics, which I'm happy to circulate to anyone interested. So, um, I'll just start with a few ideas on what decarbonization means to us because decarbonization has become the kind of buzzword um, for many, many different energy transition scenarios. And now we see that green hydrogen is evolving as a kind of silver bullet that's um, finally going to do the magic. And indeed, decarbonization has for quite, quite, long, quite long time been a loaded term. And in the days of the Paris, of the Paris Climate uh, Conference, Global leaders like Angela Merkel or Barack Obama were quite careful whether to use it or not, because in those days they were very well aware that decarbonization is indeed a radical term, tar targeting the whole production chain, calling for systemic and groundbreaking reorganization of a nation's economy, according to the do's and don'ts of carbon reduction. But um, nowadays, the term decarbonization slips easier from our lips. It has become mainstream because now we believe that somehow, thanks to technology and innovation, decarbonization may in fact work. So the hope for clean hydrogen plays an important role in that regard. And uh, my task for today is to point out that this is not that easy and that hydrogen alone won't do the trick because it comes with many risks and massive demands in terms of open space, even if we only look at so-called green hydrogen. Um, and we see that um, in many, many political strategies, hydrogen is portrayed as a solution to multiple energy challenges, climate neutrality, clean energy demands, decoupling of growth and emissions, and um, uh, UK and Germany, and also the European Union as a whole have um, been developing hydrogen jet strategies that um, build on strong transnational hydrogen cooperation, often with countries in the global south due to their geophysical potentials. However, countries like South Africa, Chile, Brazil, or Nigeria have come up with their own hydrogen strategies. And in many cases, like when you think of South Africa, um, their hydrogen strategy implies that the hydrogen produced in South Africa will be used to, de to, to decarbonize South Africa's steelworks, not their German counterparts in the Iron War area. So this is already going to be um, a recipe for political tensions and for some political arm wrestling in terms of hydrogen governance. Um, and um, yeah, we see many challenges ahead. There's a gap between 
technological euphoria and the real risks um, that are implied for nature and society along the whole H2 production chain. There's water scarcity because hydrogen production needs so much water. There are um, conflicts, of, conflicts regarding land use, also regarding energy access, and also there's a lack of proper hydrogen governance and a lack of integration into the bilateral and domestic renewable energy policies. Um, to, be, to give an example, especially regarding the massive amounts of energy and land that are needed, um, just last weekend there was a long article in a German newspaper um, on the decommunization of the Thyssen-Grupp steelworks, one of Germany's biggest steel factories in the North Rhine Palatinate area, in the rhine ruhr area. And they are um, trying to decarbonize um, the steelwork to produce green steel that is CO2 neutral, but for doing so, they would need 3,000 wind turbines. Now, that's about all the wind turbines that the whole North Rhine Palatinate, one of Germany's biggest Bundesländer, actually have. So, and this, of course, tells a lot about the space needed to arrive at a viable decarbonization strategy for heavy industries. And that's also why many hydrogen strategies project densely populated countries in the global south as the spot for producing hydrogen. However, projecting countries like Niger or Namibia as vast empty terrains means to ignore people's livelihoods, fragile ecosystems, and already existing resource scarcity, and in a sense, this mindset falls prey to colonial thinking. Also, in a country like Niger, which has been cherished by Germany's former Minister for Science and Technology, um, water scarcity is already a huge problem, and this will most likely increase when um, much of the water would be needed for hydrogen production. Also in a country like Namibia, hyphen Africa, a German Namibian company is currently projecting a hydrogen production site in the middle of the national park. And this hydrogen production site will take about 4,000 square kilometers, which is more than twice the size of the greater London area. Furthermore, pending conflicts, such as the West Sahara conflict, pervade Hydrogen cooperation and good hydrogen governance would have to take a stance on unresolved human rights issues, issues as, especially as the West Sahara conflict is pending now for over 40 years. There's many, many people living in refugee camps since decades and um, yeah, solar um, photovoltaic uh, power stations in these areas are a huge diplomatic and human rights problem, of course. Also, this holds true for hydrogen cooperation with authoritarian regimes like in Egypt. Egypt has a very, um, very pronounced hydrogen and uh, green economy strategy, but uh, normally this kind of energy cooperation with authoritarian regimes um, is a no-go within energy relations, despite this point has of course been breached oftentimes. So where does this all lead us? Is there any chance to um, address these challenges somehow? Um, there's a concept called um, hydrogen justice, which we have been developing our research group. And this concept builds on earlier concepts of environmental and energy justice that seek to analyze um, how the right to clean air and the right to a healthy environment, as well as access to clean energy can be equally distributed. Um, it's overall a six dimensional um, concept, but for now I'll only zoom in on three dimensions and I can, of course, circulate the paper afterwards in case you want to know more. So starting with procedural justice, covering the political and democratic dimension and questions of participation. Here we need to ask which multi-stakeholder hydrogen governance constellations are currently evolving and how inclusive are they? Um, so how, how inclusive are the global decision-making structures on hydrogen and what kind of conflicts could we see there in place? Indeed, many target countries like Ghana, Kenya, Morocco, Namibia, South Africa, or, or Tunisia, these are all countries covered, for instance, by the German hydrogen strategy, have adopted comprehensive renewable energy policy frameworks to which hydrogen politics could be easily connected. But of course, this needs to be done by diplomatic negotiation. However, uh, participatory mechanisms um, for energy politics could only be found in South Africa, where um, for solar and wind projects, also a kind of public consultation is happening, like 
similar to the to the forms of public consultation that you know from the UK, for instance. Um, however, this, this may mean that hydrogen transitions will lack political transparency and are so far only loosely, if all at all, connected to domestic energy policies. And this needs to be addressed in order to make sure that international hydrogen partnerships are happening on equal terms with hydrogen governance aligned to the domestic energy policy frameworks. Also, distributive justice is asking how the benefits of green hydrogen are distributed along the value chain and within society, whether um, the right to um, clean air, whether the right to a clean environment um, are affected somehow by hydrogen production. And um, distributive justice is also wondering whether we can see new forms of resource competition like over scarce water resources are currently evolving. And here it's in fact possible that hydrogen production may create new distributive injustices especially in countries with low energy water and access rates or unjust energy and water pricing structures. Um, these um, constellations may become more severe. Um, there are um, some hydrogen projects are trying to cover this problem by saying, okay, um, our projects are based on the principle of additionality, meaning that for each quantum of water that is used for hydrogen production, another quantum of water Will be um, given will be given to the population to make sure that this is all happening on equal terms and that no resource scarcity in terms of water will happen. Uh, this sounds like a good workaround, but still it would mean that uh, water services will more than before rely on private companies and may create new resource dependency in that regard. <clears throat> Um, here we here we have an example for um, a big mega for, for a mega dam that is projected in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's the Inga Three Dam, a dam which uh, several years ago was planned by the World Bank, but the World Bank um, resigned from the project due to ethical problems. And then um, a former African representative to Germany, Günther Nope, tried to um, yeah tried to um, yeah. Re reframe, reframe the project and use it for, for hydrogen production. However, the problem is that um, DRC is already suffering from energy scarcity and energy poverty. And um, in this idea, in, in this concept, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't planned that um, the people of DRC would be able to access the energy produced by that mega dam. The idea was to use this energy solely for green hydrogen production to cover and to green Germany's energy mix. Um, the last dimension for now uh, refers to recognitional justice, and this means that we need to ask whose interests, needs, and vulnerabilities are considered in the development of hydrogen strategies, governance, and projects. And this refers to the vulnerabilities of existing populations, and um, as wondering whether these vulnerabilities may deepen, and which new vulnerabilities may be associated with hydrogen production. Um, here, um, here we need to concentrate on already marginalized and discriminated population groups that are already affected by water or energy poverty. And recognitional justice is wondering whether their perspectives can be integrated into hydrogen policies, labor laws, and contracts. Um, and here, problems may happen, especially in countries with a previous history of violating human nature or human water relations. There um, is one example, the neon green hydrogen project in Saudi Arabia, where um, 20,000 residents, including members of nomadic Bedouin tribes, are facing displacement because this green city is going to be going to be built and there may be a huge problem of land grabbing happening. And land, land conflicts occurring over the H2 project in Namibia and the Sao Kaib National Park that I've mentioned before are a similar case. Yeah, other domain, the dimensions refer to human nature relations, to historic injustices, and also to questions of technology transfer that more touch the epistemic level. So um, where does this lead us? And is there actually a future for green hydrogen? Some points we can all agree on are the uh, usual solutions, carrying out hydrogen risk assessments and integrating hydrogen justice into project planning, infrastructure planning and governance agreements will of course help in order and make sure that the risks that I have already mentioned 
can be better taken into account already during the planning period. This is something I, something I haven't seen happening in Germany so far, because so far the hydrogen jet strategy was very much about geopolitics, competition, and the hope to be one of the first countries going, going green. Um, then uh, carrying out industrial and social life cycle assessments may be very important to cover the whole hydrogen production chain. Um, especially social life cycle assessments haven't been happening so often in the hydrogen field and there's also some more research to be done, especially on an interdisciplinary level. What I find very important is that um, hydrogen project planning should be better aligned with um, eco-social standards, um, which are currently developed by several, several green think tanks. Also, they should be aligned with development cooperation standards and also with the energy policy frameworks of each, of each country. And so far, um, the hydrogen strategies and the domestic energy policy frameworks are mostly running on parallel paths. And this um, means that hydrogen projects are something very much externalized within societies and they are not just not connected to the policy making. And so there's no real international cooperation going on so far in that regard, at least not in a way that the domestic level is also integrated into this kind of huge transition process. Also, I think it's very important to concentrate on less remote hydrogen projects, also due to, to, due to transport costs. And um, here, it's, um, here it's important to closely align them with the specific industrial needs. So for instance, the city of Bremen in the north of Germany is wondering how to decarbonize their steelworks. The steelworks is of course much, much smaller than the Tusen Krupp one. And uh, they're planning to um, erect lots and lots of wind turbines along the North Sea coast. And this may in this case be sufficient. And it would of course be a, be a solution that is not relying on vast empty territories in foreign countries somewhere else on the earth, but it's a much more responsible and much more sufficient solution. However, overall, I think it's very important to be aware of green hydrogen's role for decarbonization and for just transition. As Mark has already pointed out, green hydrogen only makes sense in some very specific industrial sectors, not for, your, not for cars, maybe also not for everyday flights, but only for transatlantic flights or for very heavy vehicles or for military or for steelworks. Um, this is why in Germany we say that green hydrogen is not a normal energy source, it's the champagne of energy sources because it's so delicate and costly. So I think it's very important to underline that it's not a miracle solution to resource scarcity and fossil fuel path dependency and energy dependency, but it's rather making sense as a kind of tailor-made solution for very specific energy challenges. And I think it's also important to underline that it's not providing the magic decoupling of production, growth, and resource use effect, which is illustrated especially by the Tristan Coop case and the Namibia case, if you just think of the large terrains that are needed um, to decarbonize huge steelworks. And this also says a lot in terms of political economy. It means that green hydrogen won't do the trick. It won't, um, it won't, um, un it won't make this kind of um, decoupling of emissions and growth possible. And if we, if we think of, uh, if, if, we, if we say decarbonization, we also, we always have to say, have to be clear that decarbonization needs to go hand in hand with degrowth and um, be very well aware of that. So far, with a political, political science point of view, I'm very happy for the discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Francisca. Um, great. Um, and thanks to both speakers for, for keeping so marvelously well to time. So now we have, um, you know, 20 or 30 minutes, if we, if we, if we wish, for discussion. Um, and if, um, in the usual manner, if, um, if you could raise your hand in the reaction button uh, at the bottom of your screens, uh, I assume is where it's at. Um, then uh, we can, you can uh, address either speaker or, or both. I'll just kick off with a couple of brief questions to, to, for the speakers, um, starting, starting with Mark, um, really. Um, I'm essentially a lay person in this discussion, so I'll, um, I'll ask a, a, a fairly simple question, which is that, so your, your, um, your, the title of your talk is um, 
the use of only green hydrogen for limited ap applications in a 100% clean renewable energy world. Um, now, you and, and you very convincingly debunk the green pretensions of blue hydrogen and, you, and, and obviously gray and black and brown hydrogen can be uh, uh, dismissed out of hand. Um, what about these other marginal uh, colors of the spectrum that we're hearing about increasingly like gold hydrogen and so on? Is, is, uh, is, is there any mileage in these or is this just another um, little um, entertaining distraction for the, for the, for the media? Um, and what about those limited applications? Um, what, you, you, you looked at, for example, at the role of hydrogen in, in uh, you know, um, heavy vehicles, heavy goods vehicles. Um, if you were to summarize the, use of the, the, the usefulness of this um, gas uh, in, in, in the energy transition, what, what would be your summary of it? Um, so very straightforward layperson's question there. And for Francisca, I was wondering really um, from your analysis of the trends in the political economy of green hydrogen, the plans of governments and corporations and, and such like, are you getting the sense that um, most of the, the land area that you've talked about being um, carved out for the production of, the, of, of, of this stuff, is this largely in the global south or is the more dominant pattern the, the sort that you mentioned in connection with the, the steelworks in, in Bremen, um, where you know, a, a corporation will, um, will uh, rent local land and set up wind turbines for, for green hydrogen production in the, in the locality. So um, if we could start with um, if Mark and then Francisco, perhaps. Right. Um, yeah, so I think we should really focus on what works and what is the cleanest and not anything in between. So like I think there was turquoise hydrogen where you use pyrolysis or something. You know, if you're going to use, and we, don't, we don't support the use of biomass. Um, or bioenergy for hydrogen either. In fact, none of our plans even include bioenergy. The one exception is if you're going to have waste methane from a landfill that would otherwise just go to the air. One thing that could be done is you can capture that just without, it doesn't require carbon capture equipment like CO2 where you need energy, you just put pipes and you capture the, the natural gas. And that could be used for steam and methane reforming and for the hydrogen used to be used in a fuel cell. But that's really the only application the non-green hydrogen application is when you're going to capture waste hydrogen from let's say a landfill or it could be from a rice paddy um, or from a digester. Um, so yeah, we don't think that all these other colors in between because we're trying to eliminate air pollution simultaneously with uh, greenhouse gases and also provide energy security. And by far the best way is to do it with just green hydrogen. There are two different types of green hydrogen. One is the with electrolysis where you have a separate photovoltaics or wind turbine to provide electricity, but there's also new technology where you actually have the, the electrolyzer built into the PV panel, which is even less equipment. Um, that's, that technology is still a little further away, but um, that's actually intriguing because you're gonna uh, really need one, basically in a PV panel, you can produce the hydrogen itself. And that would even be the minimal amount of equipment and you eliminate the need for transmission between the PV panel and the electrolyzer. Um, with regard to uh, the applications of hydrogen, yeah, there are limited applications. Um, you want to do as much as you can with battery electricity. I mean, battery electricity is always going to be more efficient because uh, all you're doing is putting electricity in a battery and taking it out versus hydrogen where you need an electrolyzer, you need to compress the hydrogen, you need to store the hydrogen, and then you need to run it in a fuel cell and all those things have efficiency losses. So for most applications, you're going to, for like vehicles, for passenger vehicles, you'll need two to three times more wind turbines for that. But the tables turn when you get to large heavy duty transport. Uh, and as, as has been mentioned, you know, using it in steel production, there's actually a hydrogen method of, of doing that. Um, I don't, I mean, numbers I've run on that don't, if you actually look at the energy in going into steel production worldwide, I mean, you're basically replacing, um, I mean, anyway, it's, it's, it is being done. I mean, Sweden already has a steel plant that is a green hydrogen plant. They're building um, in the US, they're building them as well. Um, 
I think that's the way to go. I mean, that's the only way you're going to really decarbonize steel. So we have to make that the most efficient as possible. And the only other application that I see is useful as remote microgrids because of the combined electricity and heat production, where when you don't have when you don't have a steady source of electricity and you have very seasonal swing, big seasonal swings like in the Arctic, you have an Arctic community. Um, you you could use photovoltaics and batteries, but generally for longer term storage, that one good the bet one benefit of hydrogen is you can store it for a long time and you can store it pretty cheaply, whereas battery storage is more expensive. Um, so you you know to have like multiple weeks of battery storage, it's going to be more expensive than multiple weeks of hydrogen storage. So that's where an advantage, but when you have regular electric power grids, that's not a good application um, just because you don't need to store um, electricity for weeks. You can, because uh, you, you have so many sources of electricity coming in. Thank you. Um, and Francisco? Um, yeah, to answer, to answer your question, I think it's very interesting to zoom in on the way German research and technology politics have been um, evolving regarding hydrogen, because that tells a lot about the political strategies behind. Um, so far, we have three very, very large research projects in place, some of the most expensive ones that the Federal Ministry for Science and Technology has been paying in the last years. And these projects focus um, on hydrogen electrolyzers, on pipeline, pipeline con construction, wondering whether the existing pipelines can also be used for, for uh, transporting hydrogen as a gas. And then um, another um, project is uh, the so-called potential atlas that is wondering where in the world can we find the best geophysical potentials built this atlas is not zooming in on the political and social sides at all. And this tells a lot about the way in which um, hydrogen is very much framed as a, as a geopolitical issue. And so far we have several, on a, on a more diplomatic level, we have some corporations evolving with uh, Brazil, Chile, South Africa, um, Morocco, in the, Morocco and the MENA region. But um, wondering whether it's feasible to produce green hydrogen there is always uh, a function of uh, the cost of production, the geophysical potentials, but also the transport, yeah, the, tra the transport cost costs, and of course also also the social and political situation. And this, of course, means that rem more remote places like South Africa or Australia just don't make so much sense in the picture. And this is why the MENA region may be the one where more hydrogen projects may be, may be happening. But even there, um, production costs may be very, very high. Um, and I, I, would, I would in fact think that um, hydrogen production in Spain or along the North Sea coast, North coast North with wind turbines would be, would be the more feasible one. I'm sorry, Francis, I accidentally clicked a button which um, yeah. set a, a, an existing video on my screen. Um, had you finished just then, sorry? Uh, yeah, nearly. Uh, and what I also find very interesting is that at the moment, lots of re research proposals are going out on feasibility studies, for instance, in Ukraine or Iran. So Germany is also very much looking east and wondering how Ukraine can be part of the picture. And these proposals have been released already before the war came. But it also means, of course, that we see some strategic interests involved. Great, thank you. And apologies once again for the interruption there. Um, the, the hand up I see is of um, someone under the name Safe Landing. Safe Landing, I think, is a campaign or NGO working for just a sort of just transition in the aviation industry, but you can perhaps- Yeah, it's, it's Finley Asher. I just couldn't change my name um, on Zoom, but yeah, I'm in Safe Landing. It's climate concerned aviation workers. So that's why I was kind of interested in Mark's point about hydrogen might be an ideal use case, well, one of the niche use cases for hydrogen, because um, our sector says that quite a lot. Um, and I've, I'm kind of interested, um, it seems like fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer production um, is a big use of natural gas at the moment. Um, particularly at the moment, we've got fertilizer prices increasing because of the war in Ukraine and, and we're looking at Russian imports and exports and stuff. Um, I'm just wondering, do you know something I don't about how we can make fertilizer um, without green, green hydrogen? It just feels to me like if we do have limited amounts of green hydrogen, 
maybe it should go towards um, fertilizer production and reducing uh, food prices ahead of anything else. Um, I actually haven't thought about that issue, so I'm just off the cuff here. <laughs> so um, I don't know if ahead of everything else, I mean, if we're looking at trying to reduce emissions, we'd have to look at the emissions associated with the fertilizer. I mean, I'm, that's how I'm looking at it from the emissions, the air pollution and the climate point of view. And certainly fertilizers, there's nitrous oxide emissions are associated with them. And there's um, ammonia as well. And so they are an issue. Um, but uh, I mean, there is a lot of potential of, of extra hydrogen. So when it, of producing a lot of extra hydrogen, so that could be part of if you're going to use hydrogen instead of natural gas for fertilizer production, that not having thought, thought about it that much, I mean, I would imagine that's a possible application that I, would, I wouldn't do it. Either. It's not either or. Um, it's really developing, a, you know, with the limitation with the vehicles right now is that you know, there aren't long distance aircraft that are running on hydrogen fuel cells. And so until we have those, we won't have a, um, a demand for the hydrogen in that area. If, so I would, I would propose that we, that's gonna be the last thing. We have 95% of the technologies we need to transition energy right now. And that's the last part of the last 5%. And we need to do that to try to get everything transitioned by 2035 if possible. Um, but in the meantime, also working on eliminating natural gas and fertilizer production would be a good goal. Uh, but again, I haven't looked at that issue too much to really be able to speak well. Yeah, I just kind of understand it's a bit like blue hydrogen, like um, you have methane that goes in and they make hydrogen and then you get NH3 comes out. Um, and at the moment, lots of CO2 and they put CCS on that. But then, as you say, I'd imagine that would then increase the amount of natural gas you need to put in, um, right. similar to your blue hydrogen assessment. Um, but yeah, if, if you don't know, that's okay. No worries. Thank you for. Yeah, yeah, I'll look into that. Okay, thank you. Um, any would anyone else from the floor like to um, ask a question? Ah, there are questions coming in into the chat box. I've only just noticed them. I'm sorry. Um, uh, one from Eric Pino. Um, to which I'll leave the speakers to read and um, and digest, and one from Mo El Suri, and one from Maria Nelson. Um, perhaps we could ask the speakers to digest them and take them in, in turn, Mark and then Francisca. Mm. Mm. Well, my, I mean, the point raised by Eric Pino, of course, um, zooms in on what I meant by degrowth um, and by saying um, green hydrogen is, again, not a magic bullet, but um, we need to think in much broader terms and we think of several ways to, um, yeah, limit, limit production um, and be aware of scarce resources and be also aware of um, the ways in which we need to change lifestyles by, I mean, there, there, has been a, there has been a really good research article, I think it was in Science and Nature saying that the most, um, most important things one can do to cut carbon emissions is um, less flying, less driving, um, adoption of, the, of a meat-free meat -free, um, diet. Um, and of course, these are the points that would change quite, that would change quite a lot and to say, okay, we now center all on green hydrogen is again, um, a kind of rebound effect happening because um, that assumes that besides green hydrogen, nothing, nothing ever really has to has to change. And we of course need to see it in a much broader picture and ecolog ecological e economics, for instance, the works by Julia Steinberger has um, done lots and lots of, yeah, quanti quanti um, quantified work on which uh, solutions are feasible and which are, which are not. Mm -hmm. um, can I just suggest that before we bring Mark in, uh, uh, Eric, who asked the question which Francisca has just answered, um, also has his hand up. So maybe we could bring Eric in um, uh, to elaborate a little. Yeah, I didn't want to talk about the agricultural question and, and the fertilizer question at all. Actually, I wanted to uh, raise another issue, which is you've looked um, um, for Francisca, you've and we've exchanged on stuff before because um, where I come from, um, there's a big temptation to become a, a hydrogen superpower, as they say, because we have all this hydroelectricity and to actually, anyway. Um, one question this is, I have- This is, is Canada. Can, I, yeah, I but, yeah. Quebec, 
Quebec is even more particular because 50% of our energy is already renewable. It's the hydro. We have tons of hydro here, right? Which is not renewable is a very strange word, but anyway, carbon free, let's call it. Anyway, but I, I don't want to get into the hydrogen politics here in Quebec. I'm just wondering, have you um, looked at, 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 you look at the, the research aspect, the state aspect, what about the corporate sector? How is it playing the hydrogen game? And what are the chances for big lock-in on that side? I mean, all the majors, all the oil majors, all have hydrogen strategies and even have green hydrogen strategies. I mean, they're, so, so what's the lock-in potential on that side? I didn't. I didn't get um, the whole question because the line was a bit. The connection was a bit bad. And you mean um, the role of um, municipalities or the role of companies? No, corporations. What's the role of corporations in? Yeah, because uh, and and of lock-in potential mm. that they just you know yeah. dovetail. Uh, yeah. There. I think that differs quite a bit whether whether corporations are well aware of the future or if not. I mean, the Tristan Cook example um, saying that 40% uh, of the steel need to be green steel by 2035 is a very conscious and very, um, yeah, also very ambitious, ambitious goal. But um, in other sectors, like in the German transport and automotive industry, I don't see this, I don't see this, this impetus. And on a more broader political economy, economy level, this um, sums then up to certain transition risks. Um, there, there's a whole debate on trans transition risk um, going on in ecological economics, saying that those countries and those industries who are now not decarbonizing rapidly enough will at one point face, um, yeah, face a severe crisis because then it then then there will be the left behind and then for them it will be very very easy to very very difficult to leave their fossilized path so we see um, attempts to go green for instance with some of the petrol works in the emirates they are all um, very much investing into green technologies in order to change their assets and to um, prevent any kind of stranded asset problems to the, to the economies and in some companies like with a chosen book case or with a Bremen steelworks we have this kind of public-private partnership with a Bremen government um, where there's much interest um, to, to um, take the corporations with them. But um, for example, in the German automotive industry, I don't see that yet, um, yet happening. So it differs very much. And um, I think the, the, the time for this kind of green industrial policies is not always there yet. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, great. There are still um, quite a few questions um, to, to, to address, uh, one, of, one of which has come to me personally, so I'll just read it out and if the speakers could uh, listen and perhaps reflect on it if they can. Um, so, so this is from Mo El Suri. My question is related to technology readiness. Why isn't there a wider public awareness uh, and uptake of hydrogen powered consumer devices, given this industry's direct link with environmental waste and, and consumer sustainability. Perhaps in comparison to the rapid shift in developing infrastructure uh, of electrification, for example, in EVs. So why aren't consumers getting on board with this transition more, more rapidly? And Les Levidov, or is it Levidov, um, has raised his hand. Could you perhaps come in now, Les, and then I'll hand over to both speakers to address whichever of those various questions they, they'd like to focus on. Um, Les. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't sure how soon I might be called on, so I put a comment in the chat just a, a half a minute ago, but I'll read it. The, the dominant policy framework, asks, which of course includes the major companies that at least want to promote the idea of a future urban, uh, hydrogen economy, asks how to unlock the natural energetic powers of hydrogen in order to decarbonize economies while implicitly continuing fossil fuels, even in order to win a global race for hydrogen technology. In your talks, Mark and Francisca effectively undermine that framework by several means and several perspectives, which I won't enumerate here. So I would like to ask about your experiences engaging with the dominant framework at specific venues and institutions, 
What, what response do you receive? Um, well, I'll answer the first question first. Um, I mean, there really aren't that many consumer applications of hydrogen. I mean, you're not, it's a dangerous fuel to, unless it's encapsulized. I mean, it's not, well, I want to say dangerous. It's very, it's a flammable fuel. It burns very easily. You, it has to be treated under special conditions. So you're not going to see it in, a, in an iPhone or a, uh, any electronic device in your home. That's why you don't want to use it in your home. I mean, it, you need very careful conditions to treat it. And uh, it, it can be treated, but for like aircraft and for certain vehicles. But I mean, you don't want to be able to be producing hydrogen in your own home. Or, and you don't want to be having a pipeline bringing hydrogen to your home. It's just a... You know, it's just a really ridiculous concept because it's something that has to be treated carefully, a gas that has to be treated very carefully and very specially. And there are certain applications of hydrogen. I've been working on this subject since 2004 and looking at, there, you know, there are good applications for hydrogen, but very few. And it's, we should be careful that, you know, most of the companies that are promoting hydrogen have a self-interest in it. Like, and they're mostly fossil fuel companies. This is like a smoke screen for them to keep in business because they know that if you produce hydrogen, you can produce hydrogen from coal, you can produce it from natural gas, you can produce it from biofuels. So you, they're, it's a way to keep these companies in business, keep their infrastructure alive, keep them going for decades to centuries to come. So we should not entertain that. And we, you know, the only application of, of hydrogen, the only way to produce it is through clean renewable electricity, through electrolysis. So any company that's a fossil fuel company that's promoting it, we should dismiss their motives right away because we know why they're trying to do it. They're trying to keep themselves going, trying to keep their infrastructure alive. Um, but we should be very focused and narrow, keep the applications narrow and, and make sure it's clean when it's produced. Yeah, maybe to add on that question and to the political and the more political debate on the kind of yeah, backlash one may be facing. Um, I mean, I'm not so long um, in that kind of business uh, than um, as Mark. I'm only focusing on the on the issue since two years now. And so far in Germany, the debate has not been very politicized because the debate has mostly been framed by technological means and potentials. And it was mostly um, been done in the circles of Germany's Ministry for Science and Technology. It wasn't uh, connected to um, to the, to the energy ministry and it wasn't connected to the ministry for development cooperation for instance and that means that uh, it was effectively depoliticized and the kind of criticism um, to the hydrogen justice and uh, to the hydrogen strategy was on the one hand coming from the political left mostly focusing on eco-social aspects and then also from the very political right focusing on security issues um, Funny, funny, funny be saying, okay, now will these pipelines be facing terrorist attacks, which is, but which, which is, uh, uh, yeah, which is, of course, an, an important point, point to the debate. And um, so far, I haven't seen this kind of politicization in the debate happening, but I think with a new government, this is about to happen because, um, yeah, the critique um, of the hydrogen strategy is, ri is rising and um, there may be a broader debate to that. Also, we have several think tanks which are now developing eco-social eco standards to ensure that the ways in which hydrogen is produced um, means that ecological and social norms are not violated. And I mean, what I'm going to expect is a kind of cooptation strategy by the, by the political sphere saying that part of the criticism that people like myself are raising um, will be integrated, like saying, okay, we need assessments, we need standards, we need monitoring. This may all be integrated into the debate, whereas there may be more radical points saying, okay, um, this decoupling will not work as such. We also need to talk degrowth. This kind of critique is always um, always um, faded, uh, faded out because it means a more sustain systemic restructuring of the industry even though that many, many climate scientists are saying that now, and we have a broad consensus saying that uh, this system can't go on as it actually does. And you, in fact, you don't, don't, don't even need to be a leftist to say that, not, not the least at all. Thank you. Um, I noticed that, um, and I don't think 
anyone has addressed Maria Nelson's question, um, which are the most difficult sectors to abate and hence the ones in which hydrogen should be seen as a priority. She suggests aviation. Um, personally, I'm not, I, I'm not sure how viable hydrogen is going to be for aviation. I wrote, uh, last year, I wrote an article with Josh Moose called Jet Zero and the Politics of the Techno Fix for the Ecologist magazine. And we spoke to some industry insiders and um, did a lot of research on this and concluded that hydrogen ain't going to happen even for long haul flights until maybe the 2040s. And, and even then, there are all kinds of technical problems involved. Um, so we think, you know, radical demand management is the way to go um, in aviation. But, um, but certainly, then, certainly hydrogen tech might be viable at some point for aviation. Is that the key sector? Apart from the sectors that Mark has spoken about earlier, um, steel, for example, and long haul vehicles and so on, is aviation, uh, in your view, um, a sector where hydrogen will really make a difference? Um. Yeah, well, I think so, because I mean, Airbus is already building a hydrogen fuel cell and hydrogen combustion. I, I'm not so keen on hydrogen combustion, but hydrogen fuel cell is definitely the way to go for long haul. I mean, I just did a, I had a PhD student who did his, from the military, who did it, um, he looked at all, at all different vehicles the, with, based on published technologies, and you can definitely transition aviation to hydrogen fuel cell um, with uh, either existing or near future existing technologies, and as I mentioned, you know, there's not only is Airbus working on this, but other companies are too. And there are already hydrogen fuel cell small planes flying in the air right now. So I think this is really the only way to go. And you'll eliminate contrails too. I mean, one of the problems with contrail with aircraft exhaust is all, all these contrails. And with hydrogen fuel cell, you'll eliminate maybe 70 to 90% of contrail mass. And with electric, you'll eliminate 100%. Whereas any biofuel or synthetic fuel, you keep the contrails, you keep burning, you keep black carbon, which is the second leading cause of global warming. So there's no other solution to solving this problem, uh, the climate problem, without going to hydrogen fuel cell, long distance aircraft, unless you can do pure electric, which is probably not going to happen unless batteries um, occur. But I, I'm more optimistic by 20, I think by between 2028 and 2035, we'll have, we'll see some hydrogen fuel cell long distance aircraft. For large airliners included? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we looked at 747s and transitioning wow. them, and we can okay. do those. Um, we're beginning to run out of time, but we've got one final question um, from Pritam Singh. Could you uh, keep your question quite short, please? And then we've got a few minutes um, yeah. for, the, for the speakers, and then we'll move on to the next half of the event. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, if I, I mean, I, I gather from both Mark and, and Francisca that. What they're saying is that there is a scope for hydrogen in decarbonization, but it has to be very specific and very limited. Now, similar argument is given by some people on nuclear energy as well, that in, in general, nuclear energy is hugely risky, especially question of waste, but in a limited way and in a, in a, in a, in a very small proportion, it can be part of the uh, new uh, green deal or uh, ecological transition. If one has to compare that nuclear energy and hydrogen energy, is there any trade-off that in terms of resources involved in in in, in putting into these two different alternative forms of energy, or really actually there's no competition between them and 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 they are two different sectors. Well, I mean to say that nu <laughs> nuclear is has many more. Uh, risks associated than hydrogen does. It has weapons proliferation risk, especially with small modular reactors that grows. And um, this is, I mean, the IPCC has identified nuclear weapons proliferation as a major issue with nuclear energy. And especially with, it'll happen more with small modular reactors. There's meltdown risk. There's storing waste for hundreds of thousands of years. There's um, underground mining risk for uranium. Um, and then there's the high cost of nuclear. It's like five to 10 times the cost of new wind and solar right now. And it takes on the order of 15 to 20 years between planning and operation of a new nuclear plant. So you can plan all you want, but it'll never be installed in the time you need to solve the problem. Whereas hydrogen, you can, it's, you can implement it quickly. I mean, we already have technology, the electrolyzers, we have wind turbines, you can produce hydrogen quickly. Um, you know, for certain applications, you need appliances for other applications or, or like steel factories, that'll take time. 
but I think it's not, it's an apples and oranges comparison. They're just, the problems are way different with nuclear. And I don't see it as a, I mean, there's less, there's more geothermal electricity built in 2021 than net nuclear additions minus subtractions uh, worldwide. I mean, hardly any new nuclear is being built anywhere. And so, yeah, we can talk about it all we want, but it's actually not occurring and it's taking long and it's expensive as all these risks. So it's a, it's not a, it's a non-starter. Um, I apologize, but I actually have to run. I have to be somewhere in 10 minutes. So I have to sign off, unfortunately. Um, That's perfect timing, um, Mark, uh, because we're moving on to the next half of, uh, of the show. Thank you so much for contributing today. It was a fascinating talk and um, yeah. Okay, thank you all. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Bye. Right, um, let's move on to the next half uh, then, um, which will focus a bit more on, on Britain. Uh, Tom Baxter, one of the speakers, is, is he's authored, among much else, uh, a dozen or more articles in the conversation. Most of them are on hydrogen, and I really can't recommend them highly enough. They really um, give you a fascinating introduction to this uh, issue. Um, but before Tom, we're first going to hear from Jan Rosenau. Um, now, I've been aware of Jan's work from his blog at the Regulatory Assistance Project, which covers all kinds of energy related topics. And some of his best blogs, have, in my view, have been on hydrogen and heating, which is what he's going to be talking about with us today. So um, thank you, Jan. And um, over to you. Is Jan here? I'm assuming Jan is here, but um, I can't see him. If he's not, perhaps we could begin with, um, uh, I mean, I know he's having to, Jan is having to uh, do some social reproduction activity for his family. Um, is Tom here? Perhaps Tom could step in and while well, Jan is getting, yeah, there you are, Tom, okay. Are you, can, can, can we hand over to you? Yeah, sure, yeah. Thanks very much, Tom. Okay, um, so screen share. Uh, are we seeing that okay? Yes, yes. Well, let's me go, let me go back to start. <clears throat> Um, so really pleased to um, get this opportunity, folks. So I'll give you my take on where I see hydrogen fitting into the, um, the um, overall, um, particularly UK energy strategy. Uh, the first few slides will be on context, then I'll, I'll move it forward. So in terms of context, uh, for the UK, um, the total CO2 equivalent emissions are 450 million tonnes per annum. And you can see the big ticket items are transport, energy supply, business, and residential housing. And what I want to draw from this is the importance of us as residents. So here we are, residential housing. But in terms of transport, the biggest element in here are passenger cars. And in terms of energy supply, the biggest element is electricity into our houses. So I, as, as consumers, as users of energy and for future um, energy strategy, what we do personally is, is very, very important. More in terms of context is uh, I, I really like the European Commission's, pardon me, integrated energy strategy. And there's three main tenets to that. Energy efficiency at the core, just use less energy. It's a no-brainer. Let's use less energy. Uh, the second um, um, pillar is greater direct electrification. So we're talking about heat pumps for space heating, for low temperature industrial processes, et cetera, et cetera. And where we can use... Um, electrification um, in, in terms of either technology or it's commercially not particularly attractive. Let's look at other low carbon fuels like hydrogen, hydrogen derivatives, biofuels, etc. The other thing I'd like 
to draw your attention to it is climate science is saying action is needed now. It's not in 2040. It's not particularly uh, um, uh, to, uh, at 2050. It's now. We need to make the biggest changes now if we have to have any chance of de delivering on 1.5 degrees centigrade. And we've all seen this um, about hydrogen. It's all over the media. It's everywhere. Um, it's the most common element in the universe. It burns to water, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it also ticks the ESG box for investors. So on the face of it, when you look at hydrogen, you think, what's not to like? It, it, it just looks great. But I, I'm, I'm going to try and peel that apart and, uh, and get underneath that. And um, see, see if that, um, these features unravel a bit. And what I would say is I can put a but after each one of these. Now, um, let's start with hydrogen. At, at the moment, the world needs hydrogen. Uh, and the world needs low carbon or net zero hydrogen. And just some statistics here that... Um, that at the moment, um, hydrogen is responsible across the world for 830 million tonnes of CO2 per year. And even more so, as Mark um, Jacobson described, is that that footprint is even bigger if you look at methane emissions from, um, from producing um, hydrogen. And that at the moment, hydrogen is almost... 95, 96% produced from fossil fuels. And the footprint of um, hydrogen at the moment, the CO2 equivalent footprint, is larger than global aviation. And if we include supply chain emissions, at methane is even larger. So for me, if we're going to tackle anything first, it's current hydrogen production. It's not using hydrogen for for um, for power or heat is let's get after what we're doing now for hydrogen because that's a carbon problem in its own right. So in the UK here, uh, th these figures are um, last year before the, the, the energy price hikes, but it, even with the price hikes, the same conclusions I'm going to draw apply. So here in, uh, in, in the UK, we take um, gas from gas suppliers, we treat it, we take it to our homes, we heat it, and we pay around four pence per kilowatt hour for that. The alternative in terms of um, using energy for heat and power, or particularly heat in our house, is to take natural gas, burn it, produce electricity, and take that to your house. And um, last year, a uh, UK resident was playing something like 14 pence per kilowatt hour. Now, what I'm looking for is decisions based on an integrated, integrated overall energy model for um, UK energy. And what I think we have to integrate is power generation, transport, heat, and storage. And, and sitting in the middle of all that is a smart energy management system. And outside that is energy efficiency. So the more we, energy efficient we are, the less energy we need in these sections. Uh, our lifestyle has been mentioned is important. Are, are, are we going to turn the thermostat down by a degree? Are we going to walk more? Are we going to eat less meat? And also, um, we need this supported by planning, um, skills mix with the right people to deliver on this, and um, um, government funding to, to, to generate a low carbon uh, economy. But the thing for me is you can't look at heat in isolation or power in isolation or any of these in isolation because they all play into one another. And what I see is um, the, these spheres or these circles being looked at in silos and, and to me, that's, that is wrong. It'll, it'll produce um, suboptimal um, outcomes. We need an integrated energy model to evidence test routes to net zero. Here's a, um, a fairly recent um, uh, 
output from um, the Scottish government on um, blue and green hydrogen. I'm assuming everyone knows what blue and green hydrogen is, but um, we've got a timeline here on the x-axis, pounds per kilogram of hydrogen and the, the y-axis. Now, this is wholesale cost, not retail cost. And, and what this is telling us um, last year, that uh, if we go for blue hydrogen, so that's um, generally fossil reforming with carbon capture, um, this is the average price, which is around 5.1 pence per kilowatt hour. And what, what this is telling me, if I believe the Scottish government, that the earliest parity between blue and green is around 2034, and I may get out to 2050 before I reach parity. So that's telling me that if we're going to go for hydrogen, we will firstly go for blue hydrogen. And that, that, that's what the UK government is saying. They want a twin, twin track approach of blue and green hydrogen. So let's take um, blue um, hydrogen. So we're going to take natural gas, we're going to reform it, we're going to capture the carbon, carbon capture and storage, and then we're going to take the hydrogen to a house. So overall, the efficiency of, of that process is for the energy there and the natural gas, I'll get around 50 to 60% into the house. At the moment, if I take natural gas straight to the house, I'll get an efficiency of about 80%. So to go the blue hydrogen route means I have to import or use more natural gas, which means the gas producers are producing more CO2, uh, SOx, NOx, volatile oil, oil um, components and particulates to get blue hydrogen into the house. And as Mark mentioned to you, that's more methane emissions. Blue hydrogen, to me, has got to cost more than natural gas at the moment because I've put this step into the process, which has reduced the efficiency. And, and I think it's absolutely clear that blue hydrogen will cost more than natural gas. My own calculations are saying, based on last year's sort of typical four pence per kilowatt hour, as we would pay as consumers for natural gas, if I flip over to blue hydrogen, I'm going to be paying something like eight pence per kilowatt hour. Now, on this analysis, that's going to produce or, or push more UK families into fuel poverty if we start to use um, blue hydrogen. And that feature is something I am not seeing being presented by government or the, or the, 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 the people that are, are, are proposing um, hydrogen for domestic consumption, 4P doubling to 8P. So let's look at this in another way. Um, let's look at green hydrogen now, not blue hydrogen. And now I've got one kilowatt hour of electricity produced by green hydrogen, uh, sorry, um, of um, green electricity. I electrolyze that to hydrogen and I take that to a house if I use the, the green electricity direct, I can't understand with all that being in the way and the inefficiencies of an electrolyzer, how electricity can be cheaper or, or heating can be cheaper using hydrogen than electricity. And that's now completely flipping over where we are at the moment, where electricity is much more expensive than natural gas. So the, 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 there's a confusion in my mind as to how people can be proposing either green hydrogen for household heating or blue hydrogen for household heating, how it can possibly be a better option than either green electricity going to the house or blue hydrogen going to the house. And similarly, um, I, we have to think about capital costs, not just the operating costs, and uh, one feature here is if we go this route, electrolyzer to hydrogen to heat the house, green electricity here into a heat pump to heat the house, I'll need um, green energy stations four to five times the size to go this route than that route. But I do have to think about capital costs. 
And I, I, I'm going to share with you now some of the concerns I've got with the organisations that are pushing green hydrogen. And here in Britain, we have the All Parties Parliamentary Group uh, pushing green hydrogen. Now, um, um, in the bottom right-hand corner here, looking at who is funding the, the all-party parliamentary group on hydrogen, it's fossil companies, it's gas grid operators, it's boiler manufacturers. And what they claim, if you look at the report, there's an £89 billion saving by going the hydrogen route. Now, I thought, oh, that's a big number. So I, I, I went after the source of the number and I found it. So the unabated number, uh, as we are today, is £1390 billion pounds for unabated carbon producing natural gas. According to the APPG in hydrogen, that will drop to 1301 if we go green and blue hydrogen routes. Now I'm talking about 1390 minus 1301, which is 89 billion. In absolute terms, that is only 6% of that number. No one, or certainly in my experience of doing cost estimates, can forecast to plus or minus 6% out to 250. That, that claim to me is a nonsense. It, 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 I, I slightly change the assumption, and that number will flip over in favour of the other way. And what I'm seeing is people pushing hydrogen, organisations pushing hydrogen that will be good for big business, but not necessarily good for the consumer. Now I'll move on to transport. Uh, the biggest uh, user is passenger cars in the UK. So again, we're looking at CO2 equivalent emissions. A lot, a lot is made of bus and rail. Bus and rail are noise compared to passenger cars, vans and heavy goods vehicles. Um, in terms of battery electric vehicles or fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, other way around here, guys, um, the battery electric vehicles is twice as efficient as a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. And I think that debate is lost in the UK. We will go the battery electric vehicle route, not hydrogen for passenger cars. Lots of people talk about the, the place, and I think Mark, Mark mentioned it, is um, hydrogen for commercial vehicles. Now, the States is different from certainly Britain, where transport distances are a lot um, smaller. Um, so you're not carrying around a, a, as big a battery. And also batteries density is improving year on year on year. And indeed, Europe's biggest manufacturer of trucks have more or less dropped their hydrogen initiative and looking for um, to propose and push battery electric vehicles. And that's Scania. Here's another bit of um, hydrogen hype that I, I saw that um, the, the hydrogen mobility group were claiming that a battery electric vehicle had um, twice, or sorry, 10 times emissions of a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. I thought that doesn't pass my sniff test. Um, the, 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 um, the, the, it doesn't feel right. So I went and chased the numbers. And here, they're assuming that the battery electric vehicle is charged or, or the electricity is made from fossil fuels. Here, for the fuel cell hydrogen electric vehicle, they're assuming it's made, or the hydrogen is made from um, green electricity. It, 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 it's a very, very um, unbalanced uh, view. But the public see this and they think, yep, hydrogen fuel cells in a car are the way to go. Hydrogen is often proposed for dispatchable energy. So when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, and it may do that for a few days, how do we keep our houses warm? And um, but what I'm saying is an assertion that hydrogen is the way to go. But actually, there's a lot of other, other options for dispatchable energy for long-term um, storage, and I've listed a lot of them here. And I, I, I think that there is not the compelling case for hydrogen for storage that, that is, is put out uh, by 
the interested parties. There are a lot of other options for that, and we need the evidence to determine whether hydrogen for long-term storage is the way to go. And here, here I'm looking at um, the UK's historical energy usage. So you can see um, up to kind of COVID. And watch this scale here. So not to 700 gigawatt hours per day. I'm adding up um, gas, electricity and transport. And we get these um, seasonal spikes. If we electrify and get the efficiencies from electrification that we would if we heat our houses by... Um, um, uh, electrification, if you use electrification for transport and get the inefficiencies, this seasonal swing um, drops from 3,000 gigawatt hours per day to 900. So by pushing electrification, the need for elect uh, sorry, energy storage is reduced. Queer hydrogen might be um, of use in shipping and aviation. Uh, I've yet to be convinced. Oh, I think aviation is decades away, and it's only 3% of our carbon footprint. I think it gets too much attention, but perhaps shipping is, um, is an option. And I, I, I'm seeing a mess looking at e-methanol, so methanol produced from hydrogen. But also I'm seeing, um, and it was just yesterday I picked up in this, uh, funding is secured for two all-electric ferries in Stockholm. So the jury's out. In, um, in terms of shipping and aviation. In the UK here, we had a five gigawatt plan for hydrogen, both green and blue by 2030. That's now moved up to um, 10. In terms of um, the UK energy flows, yeah, this what five gigawatts of hydrogen looks like. It's very much noise. And I, I really don't understand the UK's hydrogen strategy as presented um, last, uh, last autumn. And that strategy has got 44 Mays, 144 Coulds with respect to hydrogen. It, it, it's very unclear. Yet I'm seeing people saying it's providing certainty. I, I just don't understand that. I, 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 can't, uh, I can't get that from reading uh, the UK's hydrogen strategy. I'll quickly look at safety. Um, th this is quite tough. Um, and safety is, um, the, in the UK, uh, is um, hydrogen safety in housing. And here's the numbers for natural gas. That's where we are today. And if you look at the predicted number of events, the predicted number of individuals um, injured per year, and the overall number of individuals per year. So that's nine. Um, now, if we go to hydrogen, that number is predicted to be 26. If we, un, uh, if we use hydrogen without any protection, 9 becomes 39. And if we look at um, hydrogen with protection, this is something called a, um, an EFV and um, a, a flow valve that presents protects us against excess hydrogen in the house, the number of um, individuals injured per year will be 16. Unprotected, um, or at the moment, gas is 17. That's the same number. But um, if you look at unprotected hydrogen, that's 65. When we protect hydrogen, the predicted events per year are 26. Gas is nine. So we're three times more likely to have an event with hydrogen in our household um, based on government figures. We moderate that risk by putting in this excess flow valves down to 16. Now, risk is probability times consequence. What we've done with the EF EFVs is reduce the consequence, but the probability is much higher. So what this is saying, I'm three times more likely to have an explosion or a fire in my house, but because of the engineering of the protection I put in, I can bring that back to the same level as natural gas. And a parallel for me is someone selling you a car saying that you're three times more likely to crash, but because of the 
safety features I've put into the car, I've got it back to the same risk. I, I, I don't buy this at all. So where I started was, was oh, I want I to see this model. Quite quickly. I, I don't see it. And um, I'll finish off now. Um, thanks for the warning. That um, energy options looked at in silos will lead to unbalanced conclusions. Big business, what's good for them, not good for the consumer. The immediate focus for me, because we know that's where we have to be, is on passenger cars, fans, domestic heating, insulation, grid upgrades, you can see it. Now is not hydrogen, and the case for hydrogen is evidence weak. Here are all the buts after we were started with how good was hydrogen, what's not to like. And I'll, I'll close it there. And um, uh, sorry, I've overran about four minutes, uh, but I had a lot to tell you. I hope it, um, you, you saw my thought process, and I hope you, 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 you saw the challenge that I'm trying to put into this hydrogen debate. So, Gareth, uh, apologies for a slight overrun, uh, but enthusiasm got the better of me. <laughs> not at all, not at all. It was a fascinating, fabulous um, presentation. Thank you so much, Tom. And sorry for hurrying you at the end. Um, we just have to move on to Jan Rosner for the final um, uh, final uh, presentation today. Um, Jan is going to have to shoot off shortly afterwards, um, might have time for one question or two questions, we'll see, but otherwise there, there'll be time for questions to ask of Tom, who uh, and some are already coming in to the chat box as well. So over to you, Jan, thank you. Thank you very much, Gareth, and apologies for my technical problems. Just when I was about to speak, my Wi-Fi connection completely broke down, but I'm here now. Um, and I managed to sneak in four words with beginning with age into my title, if you notice, uh, heating with hydrogen, hope um, or hype. Um, and that's the topic of my presentation. So I'm gonna focus just on heating for this, but I will also talk a little bit about the wider strategy taken in the UK. Uh, and I start with a picture. This is a picture of a hydrogen ready, zero carbon boiler that was presented to the Chancellor of the Exchequer a while back um, by, uh, in this case, Worcester Bosch. There are other models from other companies that um, uh, try to attempt the same thing. And essentially it's a boiler that can burn 100% hydrogen. Uh, so that, that's been um, widely advertised by some of the boiler manufacturers as a solution or the solution, the main solution to decarbonizing heating in the UK. But when you look closely, this is a recent advert by Worcester Bosch, the same company that made the boiler, this is what they tell consumers when they watch the video. It's just a snapshot, you can see the link at the bottom and they uh, assure the um, you know, consumers who buy this boiler that their gas boiler, even if it's a hydrogen ready boiler, will run on natural gas for its lifetime. Um, so there's somewhat of a contradiction there, um, I would say between the advertisements that we're saying and the claims that are being made. Um, I want to talk about uh, you about a number of things in my presentation. I first want to start sort of quite broad with the UK's hydrogen strategy. Um, after, after that, I want to talk a bit um, about you know, why hydrogen for heating is challenging um, and talk about some of the modeling that has been done lately. But I want to start it out with, uh, with the heat challenge that we face in the UK uh, with a really nice graphic from the heat and building strategy published in October last year which basically shows that 23% of the UK's carbon emissions are from heating buildings. So it's a very large chunk of total emissions uh, and we cannot reach the climate goals without decarbonizing heating. So that is why uh, there's so much talk about using hydrogen for heat because heat is a very big chunk um, of our emissions. And um, you know, when you look at how rapidly we need to reduce, um, this is showing the net zero uh, delivery pathway um, compared to existing policies, there's a big gap between them. You know, the green line showing you where we need to be by 2040 um, and the blue line where we currently are if we are not adding further policy. So that's why there's this huge opportunity for decarbonization and that's why um, hydrogen is being promoted as one of the options. And um, you add on to that is that we currently do not make enough progress. This is a research that I led for the UK Energy Research Center a while back, where we looked at the current rate of deployment for different heat technologies, such as heat networks, heat pumps, but also insulation measures. And the um, little home symbols here in light green indicate the current rate per year 
and the blue ones indicate the rate required according to the Committee on Climate Change in order to meet the climate goals. And you see for all of them, we are quite far behind. Um, so not only do we have a huge challenge in terms of the reduction, we are also not making enough progress. And that's where so hydrogen supposedly comes in as a key solution. So what has the UK announced so far in terms of its hydrogen policy? There's a number of strategies and Tom has already touched on some of them. And I just wanted to walk you through them specifically looking at heating. So let's start with the UK's hydrogen strategy that came out, I think it was in August, 2021. And what does it say about um, hydrogen used for heating? Um, and this is again, Tom made reference to the use of the word could. Uh, it says that hydrogen of UK homes are currently heated by using natural gas. And the other big uh, announcement in that strategy was that in the uh, mid 2020s, by 2026, the government will make a strategic decision on hydrogen for heating. So we are still waiting for that. Nothing is set in stone at this point, but expectations are certainly high from the perspective um, of the gas industry and the boiler manufacturers. So that's kind of the first document. And when you drill down into the detail and try to find out how much hydrogen is being forecasted for being used over time, you get to this graphic, which I created um, as part of um, this presentation. So on the very left-hand side, you see the current fossil gas demand for heating. It's about 300 terawatt hours in the UK for homes. Uh, then you see what the hydrogen strategy says for home heating for 2030. It's less than one terawatt hour. For blending, it indicates a range ranging from zero to 35 terawatt hours. So that means blending um, up to 20% of hydrogen into the gas grid in different locations. And then hydrogen heating um, for 2035, maybe zero, maybe 45 terawatt hours. And for 2050, uh, up to 210, but it could also be zero. Um, I forgot to include the number zero, actually. That It provides a range. Um, so it's, it leaves it completely open. But what is clear is that uh, in the next 10 to 15 years, if anything, there will be a very small amount of hydrogen uh, available for heating based on the hydrogen strategy. How does this compare to other sectors? Um, this is what the strategy says for um, all of the sectors where hydrogen use is being foreseen. You see industry on the left uh, and quite big chunk, power relatively small, heating by far the biggest range indicated from zero to 210 terawatt hours, as already said, and then quite a bit for transportation as well. Not so much for cars, the strategy is quite clear that it's mainly battery electric cars, not so much um, hydrogen fuel cell cars. Um, so heating could potentially be the largest chunk of hydrogen use if we were going to realize what the strategy is, is, is saying, so as a maximum estimate. So that's kind of the first document. This was followed up um, by a number of specific policies um, on heating. I'm not gonna walk you through this in a lot of detail, but essentially there's a number of trials using 100% hydrogen. One of them is already well underway um, and you can walk into a, a test home um, where you can cook your breakfast uh, with hydrogen. There was a minister in that home. It was um, uh, on television where she cooked herself, um, I think a fried egg uh, on a hydrogen stove. Um, so that already exists. There's also a plan for a village trial and potentially for a whole town to be converted up to 100% hydrogen. Um, some blending, I already talked about that, but that is currently unclear. Yeah, potentially that will happen, but not clear yet to what extent. Um, and then also um, you know, making more of these prototype hydrogen ready appliances such as boilers and cookers. So these are the key kind of policies, nothing that firmly says hydrogen for heating will come but lots of uh, research and development and testing and assessing. Heat and building strategy was the, the, the second large um, sort of strategy that came out in, uh, I think in October last year. Uh, no major new announcements, just mirroring what's already been said, um, but clearly a, a focus on phasing out fossil fuel heating by the mid 2030s. And that is important here, um, a massive drive towards heat pump deployment um, up to 600,000 units per year by 2028 um, shall be installed according to that uh, strategy. And then finally, and then I finish with all the strategies and get to more of the um, uh, cost and efficiency implications of this, 
is the British Energy Security Strategy that was published very recently in April, um, which makes um, somewhat of a bit of a U-turn. The, um, as Tom has already shown in his, in his presentation, the hydrogen strategy uh, was largely based around blue hydrogen. Uh, green hydrogen played a really relatively minor role. And this has been um, somewhat reversed because now the ambition is to generate at least half of the UK's production of hydrogen from green hydrogen. Uh, and the hydrogen target has been increased as well. So much more focus on green hydrogen. Of course, that is related to the higher gas prices, which in turn drive much higher prices for blue hydrogen. And I wanna move on and talk about um, why I believe hydrogen is problematic um, for heating. And I'm gonna start with a um, overview of existing studies that have been carried out on this subject. There's a document that I could share perhaps uh, as a follow-up, which has links to all of these studies. So all of these organizations have looked into hydrogen for heating and they all decided that um, it's not a good use of hydrogen. There should be other applications where it's more valuable. Um, and um, these are all independent studies. None of them have fun been funded by any industry. Um, none of them have been funded by electricity companies or by heat pump installers. They're all funded by public funds or philanthropy, but no industry involvement. You will find studies that will promote a specific technology that are funded by industry interest groups, but none of these are. Um, I haven't found a single independent study, no independent research at all, that concludes hydrogen for heating at bulk is the solution. Sure, some, some niche applications, um, also in the power sector, if we electrify heating, could play a role, maybe in some district heating grids, but not as a bulk solution. And why is that? Well, the main reason for that is on my next slide, which, no, oh, this one, uh, is from the Committee on Climate Change. And this shows two pathways. One is using electricity to run heat pumps and heat buildings. And one is to use electricity to produce green hydrogen and use a gas boiler. And essentially, depending on the efficiency of the heat pump, you get a difference in efficiency of about four to six. Uh, so in other words, you need about four to six times more electricity if you go down the green hydrogen route for heating compared to a heat pump, which means you need also four to six times more generation capacity, et cetera, et cetera. You could look at this in a, a very similar way, but starting with one unit of renewable electricity and how much heat output do you get? This is from another study, which concludes um, pretty much the same, uh, about a factor of five in this study, I think it was. Uh, and <clears throat> David Sieben, who is a colleague actually of Tom, and they both work together in the Hydrogen Science Coalition has produced a very handy map that shows, um, you know, just to visualize what this looks like in terms of the land area, how much more offshore wind would we need, assuming all of that electricity came from offshore wind, of course, uh, which is not the case, but it's just to visualize and to show um, how much more it would be if we were going to go down the green hydrogen route. So it's a lot more uh, offshore wind turbines compared to using electricity um, via heat pumps. So that's is the main reason, not the only one, but the main reason why these studies that I've shown you conclude that hydrogen for heating is not the best option, that there are better alternatives available. My slides seem to be lagging behind a bit. Um, and I want to talk about the energy system costs, because I'm sure many of you um, will do research uh, in that area, and this is um, of critical importance. When you look at independent modeling of heat decarbonization pathways in the UK, hydrogen does not show up um, as a key option uh, in many of these studies. Here's an example from uh, UCL research published by UKIRK, um, and you can see no hydrogen in any of the deep uh, decarbonization scenarios. You see a little bit of hydrogen in the conservative 2050 scenarios, which are less aggressive and more pessimistic um, as to technology costs. Uh, but they don't achieve full decarbonization. Um, so where hydrogen uh, plays a role, you don't get full decarbonization, it mainly relies on blue hydrogen, but for 100%, there is no hydrogen in the mix. And the main reason for that is the costs. And um, there are two great studies that I can recommend. One is um, from uh, UCL, um, CRETS, the Center for Research and Energy Demand, published this. Um, this was published also in a peer-reviewed journal, um, I think late last year. And it compared the total system costs of a hydrogen dominated um, uh, system where 70% of the heat comes from hydrogen 
to heat pump dominated, where 70% comes from heat pumps, and district heat dominated, where 70% comes from district heating. And you see the system costs of the hydrogen dominated system are about double uh, to the other two scenarios. Um, and this is mirrored by many other studies. Um, here's, here's another one which just came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is from Imperial College and models, uh, again, a range of different scenarios. Uh, in blue, uh, you see electric heat pumps. Uh, in red, you see um, heat pumps, um, absorption heat pumps driven by, by hydrogen. Um, and then in green, it's green hydrogen boilers. And again, for all of the scenarios, you can see that the um, electric heat pump route is, 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 is a lot cheaper and the system costs per household are a lot lower. Um, so that, that is why the studies I've shown you uh, come to a very similar conclusion that hydrogen for heating um, is most likely not a viable option. And an important point that Tom made is that of course, there's a direct link between the electricity costs and the production costs of green hydrogen. And often I hear people say green hydrogen costs will fall by you know, 50% or more. And that is probably true because we will have more renewables at uh, close to zero marginal cost of production, but so will the cost of electricity in the grid. Um, so the, the comparison between electricity costs now and heat pumps um, and then green hydrogen cost in 30 years time are somewhat disingenuous. You have to then also forecast the electricity costs for the heat pumps uh, in, in uh, 28 years to have a proper comparison um, of the costs. And there are huge uncertainties, of course, around this. But overall, this big difference in efficiency, about a factor of four to six, will always lead uh, to cost differences that are significant, in my view. Let me conclude to leave enough time for a discussion and some Q&A. Um, so first of all, I wanted to make sure that I'm not sort of seen as just anti-hydrogen. I think hydrogen plays a very useful role. Um, I think uh, what Mark said at the beginning of his talk is very true. There are many high value applications. I mean, the power sector, uh, for example, um, in industry, um, you know, certain types of, of, of transportation. Um, but for heating, there are simply better alternatives that are more efficient and more cost effective. Um, also from a sort of total system cost perspective, not just from the consumer perspective in terms of the fuel. And then finally, there are other alternatives already. You know, we, we know what they are. Electrification, energy efficiency can, can immediately decarbonize heating. I've actually done that in my own home. Um, you know, we have reduced our emissions by about 80% by installing a heat pump um, and by replacing our gas boiler and by insulating um, the, the walls. Um, so we have technologies already. We, we do not need to wait for hydrogen to come along. Um, so I, I would suggest we focus on that certainly in the next 10 to 15 years, um, rather than hope that at some point hydrogen will come to the rescue. I want to stop my presentation with a final quote from Albert Einstein, um, who I think um, has said many smart things, and this is one of them. Uh, I really think um, a like-for-like -like replacement of fossil gas with hydrogen um, is not the right approach. We ought to be somewhat more creative than assuming that we can just simply uh, continue to use the existing infrastructure because it seems convenient and easy. There are other ways that are, um, uh, I believe, much more efficient um, and can deliver higher reductions in carbon emissions. Thank you very much. And I hope I stuck to time, Gareth. I tried to leave enough time for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jan. Uh, that was, again, fantastically interesting talk and you, you kept um, very, very well indeed to time. Um, uh, it's seven o'clock now, uh, just gone. Uh, Jan has to leave us, um, I think, at ten past seven. So if there are any questions, particular specifically for Jan, they should um, be they should come right away. I'm gonna. I noticed there's a couple of questions in the chat. There's one from Maria Nelson um, who commented while one of the speakers was still speaking, either Tom at the end of his or Jan at the beginning of his. And Maria asks, are these risks also true where hydrogen is just part of a fuel mix? Um, I wonder if you're willing to, to if, you, if you'd like to speak um, to elaborate on what you mean, that would be very welcome. Or another question is from Hossein, Hossein Keshka, who says, I agree with your statement that by producing green hydrogen, we'll sacrifice some efficiency compared to producing and using electricity directly, right? But 
bear in mind that we can use green electricity in remote locations far off the grid and use that energy to produce green hydrogen locally on site then transport it to be used quite cheaply this would be used this would be much cheaper and more feasible than building electricity lines to at attach those remote locations to the grid um, so that's a question for i think well it's relevant to some places in scotland i suppose for tom um, also, um, Diana, if you care as to, Les Levidov asks, hydrogen scenarios can be seen as practical proposals, albeit foolhardy, and or as alibis for perpetuating fossil fuels until hydrogen, in brackets, never becomes feasible. How do you see their roles? Right, so um, Jan, is there anything in that mix of questions that, and comments that you would like to uh, respond to? Yeah, maybe I start with the last question, actually, because I, I think that's 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 the actual question in the debate, isn't it? Is, is this a vi viable and realistic solution or is this doing something else? Is this a distraction and is it the deliberate even? I mean, that that's um, that's a political question, but of course, there are real business interests in play. You know, we have um, a, a vast gas network in many countries in, in Europe and, and also in the US and other places. Um, you know, the, the, the heating system industry um, is, is very large and significant, and they have, you know, they have vested interest in keeping and maintaining their business model. And I completely understand that. You know, if I worked as a lobbyist for these companies, that would be my role, but I, I, I'm not. Um, so I think the, 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 the other question is that, well, if, if there, is there another good reason, you know, other than protecting uh, vested interests? Um, and and uh, of course, um, you know, we have been there before, in a way, with clean coal. Um, I just want to remind ourselves, in about 20 years ago, you know, the, there was huge pressure on the coal power plants, um, not just in the UK, pretty much everywhere, um, and because of decarbonisation. And there was a whole campaign uh, by the industry saying, we can retrofit CCS, we can have clean coal, don't worry about it. Do you know how many coal plants exist in the world that commercially operate and have CCS fitted? There's just one, and that's in Canada. And do you know what the carbon that they capture is used for? It's used to extract more oil from a mature oil field. Um, and the capture rate is very small. Um, so the, the campaign that was driven, and there was a lot of money, it was billions of public funds invested in innovation, research and development, um, has resulted in almost no carbon reduction um, and has resulted, um, I would say, perhaps in delay because we were banking on clean coal and haven't done enough with the alternatives. So I think there is a real danger that we just see the same again. You know, if we wait for a technology to come along in 15 or 20 years, and I've shown you the, the figures from the UK, let's believe the highest estimates by the mid 2030s that adds up to a more, bit more than 10% of the current fossil um, gas use in the UK. Uh, so by the mid 2030s, if it's 100% green hydrogen, zero carbon, we would decarbonize a bit more than 10% of the fossil gas used for heating. Uh, that leaves us 15 years to do the other 85 or 90%. Uh, I think that's a very high risk strategy. Um, and the, the second question that is kind of linked to it is, well, what about the transportation costs? What about the electricity system costs? What about if we transport it, if we import it? Um, and of course, all these things have been modeled by the two studies I've shown you, the CRED study and the Imperial College study. They've looked at all of these aspects. I'm not an energy systems modeler, but they have looked at systematically using um, you know, a grid model, using a gas grid model, um, looking exactly what the costs would be, modeling this over time for every day of the year, every hour of the year. Um, and that's what they come out with. Um, so I think if you want to interrogate that, I encourage you to read the papers. Um, I don't think you will find um, any paper, uh, at least I haven't seen any, that um, does this analysis and relies on uh, full decarbonization and comes to the conclusion that hydrogen is the cheaper option. I have not found a single study. Thanks. Um, uh, Tom, uh, would you like to respond to either Les Levidov's point or the one, or and or uh, the one about um, uh, offshore or, or not offshore, but remote locations of energy production? Well, well remote locations, there might be a niche for um, hydrogen. 
But when you look at the bigger picture and what we should be getting after in terms of um, the, the big carbon footprint um, um, sectors, it's not rural locations. And I, 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 we shouldn't ignore rural locations, but, but it, it, it's, it's niche. If I was going to be using rural, rural locations in Scotland, it's niche. And, and, and it's, it's not going to have a major impact at all on um, Scotland or the UK's footprint. Right. So the and, and in Scotland, is it mainly in the Orkneys that, that green hydrogen is being produced? Well, uh, th th there's some very good work going on in the Orkneys about um, uh, using green hydrogen. I'm, 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 I, I'm not convinced that it is the best option for the Orkneys. But what I, what does worry me is that um, conclusions based on an, an island population of uh, a few tens of thousands can be translated to the UK mainland. It, it, it's a completely different um, um, set of circumstances in terms of energy supply. And, and it, it's, it's that um, jump that, that you know, well, look what's happening in the, in the Orkneys. Can't we do that on the mainland? Just doesn't fit for me. All right. Thanks. Um, Jan, uh, you have to go now, is it? I, I can stay for a couple of Can you minutes? stay for a little bit longer? Right. Do we have, we have time for further questions if anybody would like to um, chip in? Um, I, you can, if you've raised a question earlier, you can come again, or if you haven't, um, now's your time. Right, there's a question in the chat from Mo El Suri. New technology systems are always gonna be expensive at the start, sure. But from an academic research interest, wouldn't the optimization of cost manufacturing technology carry enough potential for delivering near enough viable efficiency for hydrogen in heating in the future? given the high risk, that's above all, well, first of all, for Jan, because of the heating focus. Happy to take that. Um, well, let's assume you get 100% efficiency, just for, um, as a thought experiment, you get 100% efficiency with green hydrogen for heating, which we all know is impossible because thermodynamics wouldn't allow that. But let's assume that a heat pump can still deliver with current technology about 300% efficiency. I mean, it's not technically the efficiency, it's, it's a coefficient of performance, but one unit of electricity generates uh, about three units of heat. And, and that, that efficiency is going up. If we look at um, where heat pumps were 10 years ago, they're now much more efficient. So we're approaching a, you know, a world where this is closer to three and a half um, times. Um, so that, that basic uh, distance between the hydrogen option and the heat pump option, um, will, will never be zero. It will always be at least three times um, for that reason. The, the, um, I think the other part of the question around um, you know, to what extent can we improve efficiency and drive down costs uh, is an interesting one because currently more than 80% of the production cost is not CapEx, it's not the electrolyzer that you need to build, it's the electricity that you need to put into it to make the hydrogen. And if that is the case, again, you can do the maths. If you reduce the cost of, of the capex to zero, so you assume the electrolyzer comes for free, well, it's still 80% plus of your costs are electricity. And if you use that electricity to make green hydrogen and convert it back into heat, um, you, 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 you could use that same electricity to, uh, directly um, through a much more efficient technology. So for, I think for both, both reasons, the sort of basic efficiency differences and and the, the fact that most of the production costs electricity um, leaves me with the thought that you could never innovate your way out of this, this um, very fundamental um, difference in cost and efficiency. Great, thanks. Thanks. Um, Tom, do you have anything to add here? No, I completely agree with Jan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, yeah, it, it, it summarized it very well. I, I, I can't. Um, put anything, anything more to them. All right. Um, okay. Um, any f final questions? Uh, we're, I feel that, I mean, we've been at this um, topic for quite a long time. It's uh, two, a two, uh, an over a two plus hour meeting is um, 
quite a long one to maintain concentration for. So I'll just um, ask for a, any final, oh, Mike Kerthman, is that a hand waving? I see, rather than the raise hand icon. Mike, uh, is your, I think you're trying to come in, uh, yeah? Over to you. If we go all electric, we have to worry about something which is necessary in all complex systems for safety, that is redundancy. If we go all electric and the grid should break down, which could happen through mishap, through mischief, or through a solar storm, in fact, leaving us without electricity for several weeks or even months, we need to have something else. Hydrogen has its problems, but surely hydrogen as a carbon-free fuel is the only substance, the only organization which can offer us this redundancy. For example, in the UK grid, the maximum power it can produce is about 60 gigawatts. The gas grid can deliver well over 200. What about heating, for example, Thomas, in Scotland? What about in Glasgow with a heating year of around about 11 months, sometimes even 12? Sorry, Tom. You need to have heat to preserve life itself. Could I have some, com some uh, responses to this, please? On top of the fact that if we're going to go all electric, we need gigantic quantities of copper. Copper mines are unclean, unhealthy, and very often make very unhappy places. I could come in because I need to leave um, um, and just comment on, 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 on the very first part of, um, of Mike's comment, um, yeah, which was basically if we just rely on electricity um, in periods of uh, like an outage, we don't have a backup. You know, we, we, we basically um, end up being cold. Um, well, that is also the case if you use a gas boiler. Um, you know, what pumps the water around in your building is an electrically driven pump. Uh, what provides the ignition for the gas boiler is electricity. So you would need e an electric battery um, uh, that would provide that uh, as a backup in addition then. Um, but without that, uh, just having the gas, you could still cook on a, on a gas stove, but you could not heat your home. You would still need electricity. Um, so gas boilers, as we know them today, are all connected to electricity because they need that in order to run. Uh, so I would question... Um, the, you know, the, the assertion that you, you could uh, still keep warm um, if you rely on gas. Um, if electricity is out, then we have a problem um, uh, for all sorts of things, including uh, the heating system itself. Um, I, but I think it's a very valid point because um, you know, we, we, we have seen in Scotland in particular, um, in last winter, we have seen outages. And there are people who currently have a wood burning stove, for example. Um, and you know, if we want to persuade them to switch, we need to assure them that uh, these, these outages are not going to be commonplace. I mean, currently, I think the average outage in the UK, when you look at the statistics, is a few minutes per year per customer. Um, so I think we also ought to be careful not to um, suggest that you know, outages are commonplace. They're very rare in the UK, but where they, where they happened um, and where they were quite prolonged, of course, they caused huge havoc. Uh, and um, Tom, maybe you live live in one of those areas that was affected by it. I don't know. Maybe you can comment on this as well. The Aberdeen city wasn't affected, but the, um, the, the rural areas were. And one of the main reasons was um, that the electric supply cables w was adjacent to the tree line. So when the trees come down, they took down the, the electricity lines. So the obvious answer is don't put electricity lines close to trees. Um, I, 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 there, there was so much made of it uh, when the answer to me was, was, was so simple uh, in, in terms of how, how you design the system to get out to, to rural areas. Um, the, the other point I'd like to make, and I keep getting back to it, if we electrify the need, the need for dispatchable energy reduces because of the efficiencies we don't have to store so much energy. And, there's, and, and if we do have uh, periods of um, uh, outage, uh, well, th 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 there are many means of um, securing supply, like import from the continent, um, like increase our nuclear baseload, which uh, people don't like, 
But, but personally, I think the nuclear baseload is a very key feature of uh, energy security. Um, we could use, um, uh, still use gas, but abated gas. Um, use hydro, use thermal storage. There, there are many, many options for securing supply. But, but what I'm hearing is hydrogen is the only way to store energy that can cover the outages or the periods where renewable energy can't provide because of lack of wind or solar. And I, I repeatedly ask, let me see the evidence. Let me see the model that tells me the only way to supply um, energy uh, uh, security is to store hydrogen. If I can see the model, and, and that's kind of where I started, I wanted this integrated energy supply, transport, heat, and storage model. I, we need to see that model. In the UK, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't exist. And, and we're making, um, or, or putting policy forward on assertions rather than evidence. Let's see what the models tell us, not what our guts tell us. Thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'm going to take the next two questions together and then hand them over to Jan if he's able to stay around and to, to Tom for a final concluding uh, summation. Um, so first, um, I'll take first Gavin, uh, Gavin Caps and then Ian Madley. Hi there. Hi there. Thanks, Gareth, and thanks for organising the seminar and also inviting insights or questions from, from South Africa. So it's, it's well, one's just an observation, but then maybe one's a question as well, which is a bit more towards Jan, if, if I'm not going to slow you up too much, Jan. And thanks very much for the presentations as well. And there are other South Africans on the call who can maybe speak to some of this stuff better than me. Um, so I've worked quite long term on the platinum mining industry in South Africa and um, platinum enters the hydrogen story because as a number of you will know the platinum group metals, various of those are critical minerals in existing technologies both at the electrolyzing end and also at the converting that hydrogen to electricity in the shape of fuel cells. So one observation is um, it's been mentioned that South Africa has been developing quite a comprehensive and ambitious hydrogen strategy, at least on paper. But they're the drivers of that are not um, big gas or oil as, as in the UK, but actually the platinum mining industry itself, uh, particularly led by Anglo Platinum. That's really, really been the key player behind all of this. And actually you, you can just see it in, in the way that it's laid out. And the reason it's doing so is because this is an industry which faces an existential crisis in that 88% of the world's platinum reserves are located in South Africa. The problem the industry has always had is there's more of it in the ground than there is demand for. There was a massive boom in demand for it really from the late 1990s onwards for its use in catalytic converters to go inside exhaust systems in cars. Clearly that's going out. Something else is coming in to replace it. So they're desperate to find new uses for this mineral that they have in order to remain in production. And you can literally see it in terms of, for example, the plans for the so-called um, Hydrogen Valley, which is going to run through South Africa from the northern provinces to the Durban port, where the idea is the platinum group metal is going to be dug out the ground. They're going to be transformed into various things. And also as well, combining with South Africa's access to, um, to various forms of uh, green energy, this is also going to end up with hy hyd green hydrogen, which is going to be exported onto the world market. And it literally starts with Anglo Platinum's biggest platinum mine in Mohalaquena and goes all the way down. So there's a very sort of transparent linkage there between the interests of a very particular sector of industry and, and the way in which strategies are forming outside of, outside of this part of the world, outside of the UK and so on. So I thought I'd just share that with people and there's a lot more that could be said about that. The question, Jan, is this, um, in the figures that you've been coming up with for the relative efficiency of uh, hydrogen for heating homes compared to you know, straight uses of green electricity, um, I completely get that, but, but it, seemed, it seemed as if you, um, the figures were as if, you know, if we're generating industry with, sorry, if we're generating 
electricity within the U UK economy? Would it be green, green electricity in the UK economy? Would it be then better used for generating green hydrogen, which is then used, or just going straight into the grid and going into heat pumps? Um, where, where does the import of green hydrogen fit in with, with your costings? Would this radically change things? If it were possible to in, import massive quantities of very, very cheap green hydrogen, perhaps, I don't know, converted into ammonia to be converted back again for shipping, whatever, would that affect your figures at all? Because that obviously is what matters to places like South Africa or Chile or Namibia, which are really betting the house on becoming green hydrogen exporters to the, the global north. So, so, so how would that affect your calculations? I'm aware you have to go very urgently, Jan. Do you have one minute to answer that question? I can, I can try. Um, um, no, and I, I'm sure there will be some exports and imports of green hydrogen and costs will come down, it's, there's no doubt. Um, but I think it will be very risky strategy to assume that those imports will be available and at scale. I mean, when you read the French hydrogen strategy, the German hydrogen strategy, um, yeah, there are about 25 hydrogen strategies now out, and they all rely on imports. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of competition for it. So I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of erring on the side of caution here. I think um, you know, we should not uh, build our policies around the assumption that there will be vast quantities of cheap hydrogen available from other places. Uh, and it has also been modeled in other studies, but I, I, you know, I, I can't cover this um, now because I need to go. But there, there, there are studies that have actually modeled the cost of different imports from Chile, from, from Morocco, um, uh, and, and even Australia, and what those costs would be per unit and compare that to um, units of fossil gas. So, um, yeah, there, there's lots of evidence out there, but I, I, I need to go, Gavin. I'm, I must apologize. It's dinner that's waiting, and then I have another meeting with someone to talk about energy. So I, I, I got to rush to get at least some food into my stomach before I, uh, I leave. Thank you very yeah, much for having you. me. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and bye bye. Ian, um, you, yours is the final question. I, I, I hope it's not a, a, a specifically for Jan on heating. Um, and maybe Tom can answer it. You're on mute. I think. I can't hear you anyway if you're speaking, Ian. Can others hear Ian? Yeah, there seems to be a glitch somewhere with your equipment, Ian. Uh, perhaps you could quickly, well, we were, we've only got a few minutes left really, um, and we have to close soon, but I wonder if you could quickly, if your question is brief, you could type it into the chat box for Tom to look at. Okay. <laughs> we can we can hear you we can see you um gesticulating but unfortunately we can't hear uh what you have to say um all right i think we should um call it a day there i was hoping we'd have time to um ask tom a little bit more about his um his encounter with with the public world of hydrogen debate uh up in scotland today but um I'm sure we'll be reading about that um, in due course. Um, I just have time to thank, give some, express my gratitude to those who've helped um, get this event up and running, to Avril Horton for suggesting it, and to Seb Jenner and to Sally Sovin or Sovin uh, for helping with the logistics uh, this evening. And above all, to the four um, speakers for, um, uh, sharing their expertise with us here this evening, and uh, which is um, very well, very well received uh, by us all. Um, so thank you so much. And um, as I said at the beginning, this meeting has been recorded. And so if anybody missed uh, any of the earlier talks and would like to listen to them, um, uh, it'll be available pretty shortly um, on. Well, you can email me and ask uh, for the details. Okay, uh, thank you uh, and um, uh, yeah.
I'll close the meeting now. Uh, or I will do after I've read uh, these little comments that a, couple, a few of you have just left in the chat box. <laughs> yes. Great.